Hi, my name is John Breslin and you're very welcome along to the second in this series of video lectures on electrical and electronic engineering. Um, in the first lecture we had a look at basically the history of electricity and electronics, where things have come from, and then we had a kind of a future look I suppose at where things are going in terms of um, electricity requirements and also in terms of the increased demands on the amount of information that's passing um, around the, the various devices that we carry. So today we're going to have a look at a systems approach to engineering systems, um, more specifically to electronic systems. And basically a systems approach, um, it combines two sub-approaches. One is the systematic approach where basically we have some kind of um, problem, we need to try and develop a solution to it, and to do, to do that we have to break it down into smaller elements or smaller sub-problems, usually consisting of smaller systems. The other um, sub-approach is a systemic view. You can think of this as being a more holistic view of how the whole system works and how the various components in that system interact with each other. So having an understanding of the, the systematic view, which is in terms of what does it do and what do the sub-parts do, and the systemic view, which is an understanding of the whole system, combines together into what we'll call the systems approach. So what's an engineering system? You can think of it as being a basically a closed volume for which all of the inputs and the outputs are known. So it's like a box where you know what's going in, you know what's coming out, and you obviously either understand or have some kind of intuition about what is inside that box and what it does, how it transforms a particular set of inputs into a particular set of outputs. That closed volume or that box usually will include some component or multiple components that are of interest to us and that we ultimately have to understand and design. Um, where that volume sits and how big that volume is depends on usually how you define a function. So if you think of, for example, in a car, you could think of a car as being a type of system in itself. It's an automotive system. But within that car, there's a subsystem, which is the engine management system. That's the uh, sub part of the car that controls how the car's engine works. And obviously there's various components in that volume in that box, the engine management system that controls the car engine um, within the, I suppose, overall car system. And indeed, you could expand out from that further and think of maybe the transportation system, which is all the cars on the roads, including all of the um, traffic control systems and so on. So a very general picture of a system is basically we have this box and we have a set of inputs and we have a set of outputs. Um, Although we're talking about electrical or electronic systems here, this could as easily be a mechanical system, a biological system, um, any kind of engineering system or any more general system um, as easily as it could be an electrical or an electronic arrangement. The inputs and the outputs to the system could be of various types. Mainly in uh, EEE we're talking about electrical, electrical quantities like voltages and currents, but they could equally well be forces, they could be temperatures, they could be maybe stresses in some kind of um, um, stress test system. There could be other physical quantities. As I mentioned earlier on, where to draw the boundary of a particular volume depends on how broadly or how narrowly you want to define the function of, of a particular system. So we saw, or we mentioned earlier on in terms of the car, that that system has a number of smaller systems or subsystems and usually they are responsible for a different function. So in the car we have the engine management system, we might have the, the electrical system, we have some kind of system that controls the um, car windows, we've got the heating system and so on. So a system will have a large number of smaller systems um, and where we draw the boundary of the system will also change what are the inputs and the outputs to that system. Um, so effectively it changes the elements contained within the system depending on where the boundary is. So I'll give you an example of this now. Um, first of all, inputs and outputs. Some inputs um, and outputs are very relevant to the system that we're, that we're looking at or trying to understand. Others may not be so relevant. So as, a, as an example here, imagine we have a mobile phone and obviously a lot of people put um, thought into you know, how, how um, efficient the battery is, um, the signal strength, the, um, the call quality and so on. Whereas maybe something else like, for example, the air entering or leaving its case isn't as important as all of those other inputs and outputs. So we may decide in our um, 
trying to develop an understanding of the system to, under, to ignore certain inputs or outputs that may not be as relevant to the operation or the functioning of a particular system. Um, an electronic system basically then is a, a type of engineering system in that it's an arrangement that generates or manipulates electrical energy in one form or another. So you can think of mainly the inputs to an electronic system being some sort of electrical or um, basically voltages or currents coming into a system and within that box or that system it manipulates, it changes, it, um, it modifies that energy, that electrical voltage or current into maybe another form for some other system. Um, depending on where we decide to draw the boundaries for a particular system, the nature of the inputs and the outputs will basically change as we mentioned earlier on. So this is what I was referring to. Here is um, an example which is an amplifier. So an amplifier as you know basically consists of some sort of input that's amplified and sent to an output. In this picture here you can see we've drawn the system boundary around the um, the microphone, the speaker and the audio amplifier itself. So there's a boundary around these three items. And the input in this case is some kind of sound signal. So I'm speaking into a microphone, um, it's being uh, brought into the, into the system boundary here and then the microphone effectively converts the sound waves into some kind of electrical signal that goes into this audio amplifier and then that electrical signal is modified, amplified and sent out through a speaker which again is changing the electrical signal um, to some sound waves. So you can see the input and the output here to the system are basically um, sound. Now if we contracted that border, that system boundary and instead of including all of the components there, which was the microphone, the amplifier and the speaker, and instead we just have our boundary around the amplifier, well you can see that basically the inputs and the outputs to the system change. So instead of having um, sound waves, we are now saying that the input to the amplifier is an electrical signal coming from another system, for example the microphone, and then the output from the amplifier is another electrical signal, which again is being sent into yet another system, which in this case is the speaker. There's actually a, a term for these types of elements that exist outside an electrical signal, uh, electrical system, and they are termed sensors and actuators. And basically, a sensor you can think of it as something that senses some kind of physical variation or some kind of um, change in the environment, and re is represented in an electrical form. So you can think maybe of, in this case, the microphone, which senses sound waves and converts them into electricity but it could equally well be, um, for example, a temperature sensed from the environment converted into an electrical form and put into um, as the input for a system. So these components are termed sensors. On the other side then we have um, elements like the speaker and the speaker can be thought of as, as a type of actuator. For example, the um, electrical signals from the amplifier are being sent into the speaker and the speaker then is having a change on the outside environment. It's actually creating some sound waves. which is taking pictures through this window. We use a soundproof booth. When it's closed, it keeps the camera noise away from the microphone. The camera is operated by a motor which runs at exactly the same speed as the motor in the sound machine. Whew, it's hot in this booth. Let's get out on the set again, and I'll show how the sound is picked up by the microphones on the stage. Sound waves are picked up by this wonderful mechanical ear, the microphone, which is really a glorified telephone transmitter. This microphone changes the sound waves into electrical vibrations, which are amplified here and sent along these wires to the mixer room. The sounds from the stage microphones are mixed here so that the natural for the action in the production. 
Mr. Mixer sees the actors through this window and hears them only through this horn. Now that we've got the sound right, I'll show you how it's amplified. Get ready. The power from the microphones is amplified about 10 million times by these vacuum tubes, making the voice current strong enough to operate the machine that photographs the sound. Do you follow me? Okay, I'm back. So we're going to have a look at um, some of the systems in a smartphone. So we've seen um, a typical um, systems approach to breaking down um, various applications. And uh, let's have a look at the smartphone. So I'm choosing the smartphone, I suppose, because they are certainly a growing trend. Um, we've seen basically a growth in the number of people who have smartphones as opposed to um, regular um, phones. And um, we're going to be using them as a, case, a use case for our electronic systems approach here. So what's inside? Well, um, I don't really want you to start opening up your phones like this person here did for um, their um, examination or their what's commonly called a teardown of what's inside a phone. But um, it's interesting to actually see how um, crammed and how well designed these phones are in terms of the various systems they've managed to pack in there, um, as well as the batteries, the CPUs, the um, storage and so on. Um, actually how compact the whole phone is. and. Um, we're going to have a look at some of the systems in here. Maybe have a little bit of a think as to what exactly are the systems inside a smartphone. So here's a couple that I came up with, and indeed you may have thought of these or some more. There's obviously um, the battery, which powers the phone. There is um, an AC to DC converter, which converts from our, um, our main supply to the DC voltage that uh, a phone needs. There is probably an antenna, um, which may be used for the um, picking up the mobile phone signal or for um, picking up the Wi-Fi signal if it's a Wi-Fi enabled phone. There's probably some kind of EMI shield, so there's been a lot of talk recently about interference on um, screens, uh, smartphone screens from power supplies. Um, there's some kind of memory. There is some kind of logic board. There's probably um, a camera, as most smartphones have, or maybe two cameras. Um, a lot of the phones feature uh, what's called force feedback. Basically, they will vibrate for certain things like phone um, texts. Um, there's a speaker, a microphone, or maybe multiple speakers. There might be the speaker for your ear, and there might be um, um, slightly stronger or louder speakers for when you're on, um, on speaker phone mode. There is um, network, GPS, um, some movement capabilities, for example, gyroscopes, accelerometers. There is the processor, the main uh, uh, processing unit of the phone, um, and then various screens have touch screen, sorry, various phones have touch screens instead of um, regular screens, and sensors. A lot of phones have uh, sensors to detect, for example, if the phone has been placed nearby your ear, um, there's a light sensor which can detect the presence of, of an object near the phone and will carry out certain functions based on that, um, and buttons, connectors, and so on. Um, if you look at particular uses of phones, whether it be listening to music files or browsing the internet or making a phone call, they're effectively using uh, a range of the subsystems that we've just seen on the previous um, slide that are available in a phone. Um, I put up a picture here of a system called um, Wikitude. And Wikitude is uh, an application in the area of what's called augmented reality. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with augmented reality or not, but basically it refers to um, a superposition of some kind of information or pictures in front of a view of the world that you're looking at right now. You can see in this picture um, a person is holding up their phone. What's being shown is a picture from their camera on their phone and superimposed on that picture of a camera are a number of items. You can see um, basically three um, points here being shown in this picture which will refer to uh, places that are nearby. And what's happening is basically that places that are um, nearby, according to the Wikipedia, are being displayed in this application. So 
we can kind of imagine some of the systems that are being used in this phone uh, to perform augmented reality. What's happening is um, the picture taken from the camera is being overlaid with um, data from Wikipedia. And as the phone is being moved around, you can see a little kind of a, a radar here on the bottom of the screen. It will show you more information about the things that are currently nearby to you based on their geographic coordinates. Um, there are some other really nice applications for augmented reality, ranging from the, um, I suppose, tr more trivial to the very practical. So um, on one um, end, we have, for example, um, film companies or game companies or entertainment companies are, for example, having some kind of QR code in an ad in a magazine. And as you move the, uh, your, your camera phone over, over the code or something else, it will start to generate uh, characters or figures from some kind of movie or, or um, entertainment um, on top of the item that you're looking at. Towards more practical, we're hearing of applications uh, for augmented reality, such as um, uh, aircraft repair. So a um, engine repair person that is constantly repairing a particular type of aircraft engine. Normally, they have a big manual beside them on the desk, and they are flipping through this manual and um, basically looking at an engine, looking down to the manual, performing um, a step of the engine uh, deconstruction taking off some element, looking at the manual, taking off the next element, looking at the manual, and the head is moving back and forth. Um, the augmented reality application there is superimposing basically the instructions on some goggles or some kind of uh, glasses the person is wearing, so they don't have to keep on looking from the item they're doing to the manual. And of course, we've recently seen the um, Google Glass Google Glass project, where basically uh, Google's uh, prototype um, glass system with some projection system in there is basically another form of, of augmented reality. So in the particular example, the particular example I showed you a minute ago, which was the Wikitude, you can imagine some of the systems that are being used in here. We have obviously information coming about where you currently are located. This is typically coming from your GPS, um, maybe combined with other sources of data, for example, cell tower locations or Wi-Fi spots. Um, in conjunction with that, the phone needs to know, well, what direction it's pointing in and what kind of orientation is being held in. So maybe the compass and some of the other um, internal systems are being used to uh, find that. So it knows when you're in a, in a certain geographic location, what direction you're pointing in and what actually are you looking at. Um, the camera is another subsystem being used here because obviously it's showing you a view of what's um, being seen, seen around you. And then the internet. So some kind of query is going on to um, a service based on uh, perhaps Wikipedia data that's basically sending us your uh, geographic coordinates and looking for items that are nearby those geographic coordinates. And then of course there's stuff being shown on the screen and there's other systems being used there. So I'm sure you could actually have a think about what other systems are useful for augmented reality applications, maybe sound, maybe something else. So let's have a look at a typical um, subsystem in a mobile device. And this is, um, I, sp I suppose, the first of the sus subsystems we'll be looking at in a mobile phone. And it's the charger. So it's the first kind of point of contact between your um, phone and the outside world. Um, when you get your phone, you normally have to plug it in. You charge it up um, to get it going. So I took a picture of uh, one of my chargers here. and. Um, what you can see, or may not be able to see, it's quite small, but I've, I've, um, I've duplicated the specs up here on the top. But um, it's got an input and an output. So this is very similar to, um, I suppose, our concept of systems. Not all systems are straightforward in that they don't tell you exactly what's going in and what's coming out. But a phone charger is quite explicit in terms of its requirements. So it's saying that it has um, AC, which is alternating current. Um, it needs uh, either 100 or 220 volts. And then it's got two types of frequency, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and it will draw 0.17 amps. And then the output of this should be 5 volts, um, with um, potential current of 1,200 milliamps. So we've got our input and our output. And one of them is um, in AC, and the other is in DC. So if we were to draw a system diagram based on the um, systems approach we had earlier on, we can see that there's basically um, an electrical input and an electrical output. 
the electrical input is that of an AC waveform. Typical um, voltage here in this country is 230 volts RMS. RMS stands for root mean squared and basically for a sine wave if you took the peak value of this sine wave and you divide it by root 2 you would find it's equal to 230. So you can find the peak value of this um, sine wave in reverse simply by multiplying 230 by root 2. Um, this is a a perfect sine wave it may not be exactly what you might find in, in the main supply, but typically we represent a AC um, supply with something like this, a sinusoidal waveform. Um, 50 hertz means that it repeats 50 times in a second, and as I said, 230 volts uh, root mean squared. So this is our input into our charger. So we can imagine in, in this um, charger system inside there, there's some kind of components, there's some elements that are going to convert this AC waveform into a, um, a DC um, output voltage which is suit suitable for use in our phones. So inside this charger subsystem now it can be a bit more complex than this and indeed you can see uh, there's a link at the bottom of the slide here if you want to find out a bit more about exactly what is in a typical um, I think it's an iPhone charger they tear it down but at its um, core I suppose there are two main elements one is a transformer Transformer basically takes a high level voltage and transforms it down to a low level voltage. And secondly, we have what's called a rectifier. And the rectifier basically changes the voltage type from AC, which is typically bidirectional, to DC, which is a single direction voltage and usually a fixed level voltage as used by many electronic devices. This is a picture of the two. Um, components in um, in this, uh, I suppose, sim simplest version of a charger. What you can see here on the left hand side is a AC waveform like we saw earlier on. And it's going into two stages here. The first stage here is shown by the um, four um, dots here with these two coils in the middle is a transformer. The transformer basically is taking in a high level voltage in here and reducing it down to a lower, a lower, level, lower level voltage. And that voltage in turn then is passing through the second half of this charger system. The charger system consists of a diode and a resistor. And across this resistor we're taking our output voltage. Now what's happening here is, as I've mentioned in the transformer, it's basically reducing the um, level of the voltage. And in the diode it's going to basically um, chop off the bottom half of this AC voltage and it does that through a process um, known as rectification because the diode will only conduct um, current in a single direction and that will um, only occur when the voltage that's across this diode is positive. So effectively when the um, AC waveform is going through its positive um, half cycle the DC um, sorry, the diode will conduct um, this positive half cycle through to its output. And we get something here that's um, unidirectional. So it's not quite DC, but we can further um, smooth this out to actually get something that's approximately a straight line. So we'll see this um, next time.